Vision family and Vision Virtual, how are we doing? Pastor Jerome here. Listen, I am so glad to be back. I have missed you guys tremendously, but our time of sabbatical is always much needed and much appreciated. So I want to say thank you to the elders. I want to say thank you to you. And I want to give an applause to just the way people have served in my absence. But Chris and I and Jamari and Jordan, we are truly appreciative for our time of sabbatical. And I am excited to be back. Uh, as we get back into the swing of things, just be on the lookout for more updates as we are still figuring out this COVID-19 thing. And as things keep changing, make sure you stay abreast at the website, visionrdu.com. And then I have some big news within the upcoming weeks that I've been working really hard on. I am really excited to share with the Vision family. And look, do me a favor, go ahead and get Hebrews 11. Get Hebrews 11. We're going to read from there. And do me a favor, go ahead and let's have a, a spontaneous virtual, a virtual a spread love fellow break and you begin to tag some of your friends in the comment go ahead right now I wait I wait tag your friends in the comments invite them to join us as we start this brand new series called insane faith we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 I'm going to read verse 1 we're going to work our way verse down to verse 12 so if you can stand with me as we dive into the Word of God today Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. If you can, go ahead and get your family. Let's stand. Get the babies. Have the babies stand. Let them have their little Bible or their device, and let's read the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Hear now the Word of the Lord. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, for by it our ancestors won God's approval. Let's pray. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for this opportunity uh, to dive into the word, to start this brand new series on the importance of faith. God, I'm so grateful for the time of sabbatical, time of break, time to recalibrate and just hear from you and then come back fulfilled and ready to preach and ready to cast vision and ready to serve and ready to make disciples. God, I'm just so appreciative for you. But God, as always, we, we need your spirit. I desperately need your spirit. And I ask that you will set me aside. Move me out the way, God, that I would preach under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, as we dive into these verses out of Hebrews chapter 11, God. We're so grateful and thankful for who you are, God. We pray that as we, we tag friends and we invite people, we pray that they will hear what they need to hear. Some people are saved but need to be encouraged. Some people are saved but their marriage is on the brink. Some people are saved but they're on the brink of just severe depression and thoughts that are not from you, and they need to be encouraged. Courage, and I pray that they would be encouraged today. today. Others are, are, are unsure about this whole faith thing, and I pray that you will set me aside to do a good job of explaining what faith is, and more importantly, who is the object of our faith. So God, just have your way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, family, if you're ready for the word, just say, I'm ready. Go ahead, tag it in the comments. All caps, just say, I am ready. Well, uh, well, I, I want to start with this, this quote, a very important quote I heard uh, a, few, a few years ago. Uh, and, and it was Ernie Johnson, and he said this, uh, We all know Monty, an ordinary man with extraordinary faith. Uh, this is how Ernie Johnson described Monty Williams in 2016. Now, now a quote like that, you would think it's about... Uh, hitting a game-winning shot or a story career or breaking some type of record. But that was not the case with this quote. In fact, uh, this was uh, Ernie uh, responding to what Monty said at his wife's funeral. See, what happened was a woman, a 52-year-old Susanna Donaldson, was driving over 90 miles an hour, and she ran head-on into Monty's wife, Ingrid, who was 44 at the time, killing her. And, and here's what Monty said as his wife was just, just a few feet away from him at the hands of this tragedy. Monty said this, he said, let us not forget that there were two people in this situation and that family needs prayer as well. And we have no ill will towards that family. That family didn't wake up wanting to hurt my wife. Life is hard, it is very hard and that was tough but we hold no ill will towards the Donaldson family. Uh, but, but check this out, as, as he continued, he said something that just literally rocked me. He said, God will work this out. My wife is in heaven. God, love, God loves us, God is love. And when we walk away from this place today, let's celebrate because my wife is where we all need to be. I'm envious of that. 
but I've got five crumb snatchers that I need to deal with. I love you guys for taking time out of your day to celebrate my wife. But listen to what he says here. Very important. Really rocked my world considering the circumstance. He said this. We didn't lose her. When you lose something, you can't find it. I know exactly where my wife is. Now, what could give a man that vulnerability and stability at the same time in the midst of a tragic situation like that? One word, faith. Say it with me. Say faith. Come on, say, say faith. Faith is what gives us this strength. Faith is what gives us the boldness to do the seemingly impossible and the strength to overcome the seemingly insurmountable. One of my homiletical heroes, a pastor, theologian, author, Gardner C. Taylor, he was teaching preachers about the importance of both pain and faith. And he says this, he says, in scripture, there is no rainbow without a flood, no burning bush without the desert, no exodus without bondage, no return without exile, no birth of Jesus without childbirth. Listen, and no resurrection Sunday without good Friday. Pastor Taylor, as he was teaching preachers, but that applies to all of life, is speaking to us even now today about the importance of faith because life is filled with ups and downs, highs and lows, joy and pain. And the thing that's going to keep us stable, the thing that Hebrews calls uh, the anchor is going to be our faith. And faith must be what we understand and faith is what we live by. Check out what Paul writes to the letter, uh, his letter to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, now the word walk there is this idea, and not just how we put one foot in front of the other, though I do appreciate the imagery. The, the idea of walking is the idea of how we live. And he says we must live or we must walk. And I love the imagery because some of us walk cool, some of us walk stiff, some of us walk with a limp. But the idea here is no matter where you are in life, whether you're experiencing a high right now or a low, if your marriage is in a high place or in a low place, if your finances are in a high place or a low place, the thing that keeps us stable is how we walk by faith. We keep on moving. We keep taking one step in front of the other. Spiritually speaking, we don't give up. We don't stop. We don't give in because we don't live by circumstances. We don't live by what we see. We don't live by what's in front of us. We walk by faith. and We keep on moving. We keep pressing. As one of my, my friends, the best man uh, at my wedding, had this phrase, three words, keep it moving. And, and that's what scripture would direct us to do, that even though you're experiencing difficulty, keep it moving. Even though you're not sure what's in front of you, keep it moving because you don't have to know all the details. God does. And so this is what we're going to dive in. And so this brings us to our thought tattoo for us to understand this. Faith is not a landmark. It's a lifestyle. One more again so you can get this faith is not a landmark, it is indeed a lifestyle. One more time, faith is not a landmark, it's a lifestyle. We walk, we live by faith. It's not a landmark that we just remember in the past, it's a lifestyle that daily I wake up applying faith in God. And so we're calling this series Insane Faith. Passage Rome, uh, why did you pick that particular title? Great question, I'll tell you. The, the reason I, why I, I believe the Holy Spirit led me to call this insane faith, because insane describes how people see you and will see people operating in faith. Insane is how the outside world sees you, but insane is also how you feel on the inside sometimes. I wish I had a witness, somebody would testify. Sometimes God tells you to go some places. God tells you to reach out to some people. God tells you to do some things. And people on the outside think that you're insane. And if you're honest, you feel insane doing it. But, but, but that's what, what it means. Uh, Paul actually will talk about that later. So as we do this, this series, over the next several weeks, we're going to learn several things. Number one, we're going to learn what faith is. Two, we're going to learn what faith does. Three, we're going to learn how faith works. And four, we're going to look at examples of faith in scripture. So let's go. Hebrews chapter 11, 1 through 3. It says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, proof of what is not seen. For by this our ancestors were approved. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Four numbers for you. 40, 27, 1, and 1. 40, 27, 1, and 1. 40 are the number of verses in Hebrews chapter 11. 
27 are the number of times you see the word faith in that one chapter and there's one thing, faith. 40, 27, one and one. And what our author does after talking about how Jesus is better than everything, he's better than the covenant, he's better than angels, he's better than the prophets, he's better than the law. He, he in chapter 10, leading up to chapter 11, what the author of Hebrew does is he gives us this picture of how we should live in light of what Christ has done. But then he alley-oops at the end of chapter 10, he alley-oops us into chapter 11, and he says this in Hebrews 10, verse 38. He says, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he draws back, I have no pleasure in him. Question, hold on. Why would God say that if someone draws back that he has no pleasure in him? Here's why. B because if you try to please God apart from faith, you are wasting your time. If you're coming to church, if you're reading your Bible and you're doing these things out of works, if you're doing this apart from faith, you are wasting your time and you will never please God outside of faith. This is why Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 6, it says this. Now, without faith, it is impossible to do what? To please God. Since the one who draws near him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. You and I cannot please God outside of faith. So that begs the question. I know some of you are wondering, what is faith? I mean, if you ask 100, 100 Christians that question, you're going to get at least 50 answers, right? You ask 100 Christians what, what faith is, you're going to get at least 50 answers because faith is misunderstood and faith is misapplied. In, in the 90s, a guy by the name of Norman Vincent Peale wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. In 2005, Napoleon Hill wrote Think and Grow Rich. In the late 90s and into the early 2000s, you saw the rise of what was known as the Ward of Faith movement. And here's what happened. Biblical faith got replaced with positive thinking and positive confession and speaking things into existence. And in other words, what happened is people got away from what the Bible says about faith. And instead of putting faith in God, we begin to put more faith in ourselves. And because we put more faith in ourselves, we constantly found ourselves disappointed and frustrated with God. What God is saying, you didn't apply biblical faith. You tried to use me to get what you want. And sadly, many pastors, bishops, conferences, books was replacing faith with positive thinking, replacing faith with positive confession. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with thinking positively, but we got to make sure that, our, that the Bible frames how we see this thing that we call faith. And the larger problem is that faith got replaced with what's called self-actualization. It, it was all about using God to get what we want. Listen to me, faith is not about using God. It's about pleasing God. Romans chapter 4, uh, verse 17 says this to, to kind of really blow up this whole speaking things into existence because that, that's one of the misnomers about faith is that, that somehow we can do exactly what God says. But listen, listen to what Romans 4, 17 says. Listen, listen to what Paul actually says about this. He says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. So he's referring back to the Old Testament, but then he says this, in the presence of the God whom he believed, Abraham believed in God. Now it says, the one who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. Paul is talking about God's ability. He's pointing back to creation saying, God is the only one that speaks things into existence. It's not that we speak it, we trust the one who can. We trust the one who can to, from, from nothing. He spoke and the world had to come. He spoke and light had to be. That's the one we trust, not ourselves. And so listen, biblical faith isn't about what you speak or getting what you want. Biblical faith isn't about you or me. It's about who you believe. Now, why is this so important? Because if the foundation of your faith is shaky, don't be surprised when you crumble when your faith is tested. I'll say that one more time. If the foundation of your faith is shaky, if the foundation of your faith is anything other than the God who gifted you faith, if your foundation is anything other than him, don't be surprised that you crumble when your faith is tested. So it's so important that we get this. So again, what is faith? Let's break down what's said in verses one through three. The first thing we need to recognize is the author of Hebrews lets us know that there's a difference between hope and faith. There's a difference between hope and faith. Oftentimes when we hear the word hope, it's attached to some type of emotional feeling. 
Uh, you're hoping that your favorite team wins a championship this year. You're hoping that someone gets healed. You're hoping that you find your soulmate to do life with for the rest of your life. But listen, biblical hope isn't, uh, is, isn't about a desired outcome. It's an assured outcome. See, see, biblical hope isn't wishful thinking. It is said. It is done. Hope is said to be an anchor of the soul in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. And, and, and here's the point he's making here, why we need to understand the difference between hope, hope. Again, hope is assured. It's not if, it's just when. It's going to happen because God said it. But hope is described as an anchor because the strength of your hope is tied to who you're placing your hope in. And so the reason the Bible describes hope as an anchor is because when your hope is in God, and the anchor is the imagery of it keeps the boat stable so when the winds blow, the boat stays where it is. And God is saying, if you have faith and your hope is in me, when your hope is in me, when the winds blow, when financial winds, relational winds, occupational winds, when the winds and the pressure of life blows, you'll be able to stand still and know that he is God because of the source of your hope. So he makes a distinction between hope, which is assured, and faith. Listen, hope is a promise waiting to happen, not a wish that may or may not happen, may or may not happen. The second thing is faith, based on that verse, has evidence that cannot be seen. Now, let's be honest. I mean, if you're a critical thinker, like me, when you read, you ask questions. And so uh, you, you had some questions, well, at least one question. The question I had when I read this long time ago, years ago, is, how, how can it be proof if it's not seen, right? Uh, like it's the evidence of things not seen. Now, how is it evidence if you can't see? You know, e evidence is uh, things that you can actually see. And, and on top of that, I was struggling because there are other scriptures that show us that, that faith was then seen. Peter says he, he saw, he was able to see his majesty in 2 Peter. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 how over 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus. But, but here the, the author says that faith is evidence of what's not seen. So I have to ask, is he advocating blind faith? No. But again, evidence is what detectives build, DNA, hair follicles, uh, articles of clothing, because they want proof. Proof or evidence is what the atheist asks the Christian to provide to prove that God exists. So why would the author write? that faith is the evidence of what we can't see or proof of what is not seen. That's why hope was mentioned. B because we don't hope for what we already have. We hope for what we want to see come to pass. I like the way R.C. Sproul says it, God rest his soul. He says, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, but I know that God knows what tomorrow is going to bring. So if God promises tomorrow will bring something, and if I trust God for tomorrow, I have faith in something I have not yet seen. That faith serves as evidence because its object is God. You see it? He's saying, I, I, I don't see it yet, uh, but I have evidence because God has a track record. Uh, see, I, I, I wish someone would testify right there. God has a track record, and even though I don't see it now, I got past evidence of God's track record, and God will produce. The, the point is, if God tells me that something is going to happen in the future, I can trust and I can rest that it will. A.W. Tozer said this way, faith is seeing the invisible, but not the non-existence. So number one, uh, there's a difference between faith and hope. Number two, faith has evidence that cannot be seen. But number three, faith has evidence that can be seen. In, in a few moments, the author of Hebrews is going to transition to what we call the hall of faith. He's going to give us all of these Old Testament examples. And, and what, what you'll find is that when, when Abraham was going through what he was going through, when Sarah was going through what she was going through, when Noah was experiencing what he was experiencing, they didn't have the book of Genesis. They had to believe at some, for something that they did not see and that one day it would be seen. It's important that we remember that when we are reading the Bible, we read and we have the evidence. When they were living it, they didn't have the evidence yet. They had to trust that God would do what he said he's going to do. And God is saying the same thing to you right now. Do you trust me? Or are you trusting them? Do you trust me? Or are you looking at your circumstance? See, I will, God says the evidence is waiting. You just got to hang on in there. You just got to stay put. That's why I said stand still. Sometimes faith is not moving. Faith is just standing still and trusting. And God is saying that I need you to stand still 
and know. But faith does have evidence that can be seen. So that's why the author transitioned to all of these Old Testament. He points back in verse 3. He points back to creation to say, we got a track record. See, see, the earth <laughs> you're on right now, that's evidence. The sky you look at, that's evidence. The sun, that's evidence. The moon, that's evidence. The stars, that's evidence. Okay, the fact that you woke up, that's evidence. Blood flowing through your body, that's evidence that God who spoke the earth into existence and created man from dust and created the woman from a rib. This God is active. He's at work. He's present. He's there. And he's pointing us to that. So the author points back to say, look, we have evidence of God's track record. God, God so, so what about you? You know, oftentimes I, I think about uh, but before we got this building and just the situation we were in and just, just praying and, and trusting and believing God. Listen, it's not a vision if you have it already. You don't have to hope for what you already have. It's not a vision if all the tools are already in place. And we will believe in God for this building. And, and I want to show you a video right quick. Uh, this is a video that I did but before we signed anything, before anything was in place. God told me to do a prayer walk around this building. And he told me to walk around it several times. So I walked around this building 13 times, laying hands, praying, saying, believe in God. And I want to show you this video because I want you to see that faith believes for what you don't see but now we can see it. Roll that video right quick. All right, so August, August the 21st, uh, 2019, and this is my first prayer walk um, by myself, but we'll be here actually tomorrow, the 22nd, with the elders and some key staff members uh, to pray over this. So we're operating in faith, and I wanna get this on tape um, because we're believing God uh, to open up this door. And we believe this will be a, a great opportunity for us to, to serve our city well and for us to engage people that need to hear uh, the message of the gospel. And so um, I just ask you to join me in prayer. I'm going to walk around here and just pray and see what God will do. Pray that the numbers will work. Pray that the people will come. And more importantly, that disciples will be made and that the city will be transformed through us as we glorify him. All right. Love you. Peace. And so when, when, when you look at that video, right, uh, um, I, I, I didn't see it, but I believed it. Now we're in it. Now, now in God's sense of humor, we've been outside of the building longer than we've been in it. But in the, shoe for, the few short months we've been in here, we've been able to plant churches. We've been able to do outreach. We've been able to feed families. We've been able to, to adopt schools. We've been able to send missionaries to Ghana. And now we're in the process of building a school for, uh, for kids with special needs over in Ghana. Why? Because we operated in faith. We didn't see it. Now we do. And God, God is, is speaking to you. Uh, God is saying, believe that he can reconcile your marriage. Believe that he can give you that promotion. Believe that he can feel you to be able to submit to him. So again, what is faith? Real simple, because I know you're like, Pastor, you still haven't told me what faith is. Okay, real, here, here you go. You ready? Faith is believing God. Oh, that's not deep enough for you, but it should be. Faith is believing God. Notice I did not say believing in God. Pastor Jerome, what do you mean? Why didn't you say faith is? No, no, faith is believing God. I did not say believing in God because believing in God is based on your ability to believe in him. When you just believe him, it trusts in his power and not my own. It trusts in his power and not your own. Faith is believing in God. Faith is believing God, believing what he said, believing what he says, believing what he did, believing what he does, and believing what he will do. That's why Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's why Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 and Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, but he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. What is Jesus saying? Faith is believing God. If he said it, then you believe it. That's it. He, he doesn't have to check in with you. He doesn't have to check in with me. He doesn't have to give us all the details. Faith is God said it, I believe it. God promised it, I believe it. And I put my hope, my trust, and I rest, and I put my blank check on his table. Because faith is believing God. And these are the mechanics of faith that we need to understand. Number one, faith, as we said, is believing God. That means faith must have an object. So the object of our faith must be God himself. The object of our faith must be God. But what happens to many of us is what, what gets us is things happen, right? 
God, God, I'm believing you for this, but then trouble happens. God, I'm believing you for this, and this trouble, trouble happens. And we got to be able to keep our eyes on Jesus. You know, I was reading up on, and I saw this uh, thing about zebras and what a mother zebra does in order for her baby zebra to know who she is when she's around, when the baby's around tons of zebras, all with similar stripe pattern, is she gets the baby away for a couple of days and she looks intently into the eye of her child so that her child will be able to distinguish his mom from the other zebras. In other words, she makes her baby fix her eyes on her in order to know her, to know her pattern, and to know her voice. And so God says it this way, he says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Sometimes we need to get away from distractions, get away from social media, get away from all of the distracting voices so we can fix our eyes on Jesus because faith is believing God. Number two, faith is pleasing God. This is what it means at the core of faith. Faith is not about, listen to me, this is going to hurt somebody, it's going to burst your bubble, this is going to mess, mess with your theology, but faith is not about your happiness. Faith is not about you being happy. Faith trusts God even if he tells me to do something that doesn't make me happy. That's why it says without faith it's impossible to please God. What's the inference? The inference is that you and I want to please him. That means that God tells me to do something, I want to do that. Listen, God is not into one-sided relationships. Uh, out there just in, in the comments, uh, just, just let me know, have, have any of you ever dated a taker? Have any of you been in a one-sided relationship where the, the person took, they, they took what you could give them emotionally, and they took what you could give them sexually, and they took what you can give them financially, but they never gave anything back in return? Don't put their names in the comments. Just say yes or no. Don't expose them. Uh, but, but, but some of us, yeah, don't, 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 don't put the name in the comments, boy, okay? Don't, don't, don't do all that, right? Yeah, but, but some of us know that we've been in a relationship with a taker, and it was all about what they could get, and they, were, they just drained you. And God says, that's how some of you treat me. You only want what you can get from me. You only want what prayers I can answer. You only want what promise you want me to keep. But when I call on you, and when I tell you to go somewhere you don't want to go, now you got to fast and pray. <laughs> but when it, when it comes to your will, God says, you want me to be this cosmic genie who grants your wishes. But, but faith is about pleasing God. A, a scholar says this uh, in, in the aspect of, uh, in reference to pleasing God, he says, so many of us are practical atheists. We may be theoretical theists, but our lives betray a practical kind of atheism in that we don't live in order to please God. We don't live in order to please, uh, we don't live in order to please God. It can only be because we do not really believe he is worth our attention. Mm, bars. We don't live to please God because we want to come to him when we want what we want. Listen, Christ likeness. I say it this way all the time. Everybody want to be Christ like until it's time to be Christ like. It's time to be Christ-like when God tells you to do what you don't want to do. It's time to be Christ-like when God is telling you to love that difficult person. It's time to be Christ-like when God says pursue that person that has not pursued you. Right now, God is telling you to stay, but you want to go. And so you're trying to do everything you can to get God to do your will. And God is saying, no, I want you to stay right there. God, right now, God is telling some of you, I want you to apologize, but you're saying, no, they need to apologize first. And so you're wrestling with God, but can I tell you, you already lost that wrestling match. God is telling you to start, listen, I need you to listen to me. God is telling someone right now, he's saying, start with what you have, but you're waiting for everything to get in place. And God is saying, that's not faith. The fact that you're waiting for everything to get in place, you're not operating in faith. And God is saying, God is giving you a ministry for women and families battling infertility. And God is saying, just begin to write that thing out. But you keep saying, well, but, and God is saying, I, I, I want to give you a ministry of adoption. But you, you're wrestling because you're mad and you're frustrated with God. And God says, I understand. But and you're saying, but I haven't even adopted the first child. But God said, just begin to write it out. If you take the step of faith, I will show you what the next step is. But you can't see it it all right now because if I show it all to you then you're not operating in faith. God is saying trust him. And too many of us we don't move because we don't trust. Listen to me discomfort isn't always the devil. Sometimes it's divine development. 
God puts you in a place of discomfort because it's in that place of discomfort where innovation happens. It's in that place of discomfort when your prayer life increases. It's in that place of discomfort when humility happens. Now, none of us wanted this COVID-19 thing to happen, but look at all of the innovation that's coming out. What God says is, even when I allow difficult situation, in the midst of that difficult situation, don't forget that I'm in the foxhole with you. And I will speak to you. And in the midst of tragedy, Monty can say, I know where my wife is. In the midst of tragedy in your marriage, God is beginning to speak and to redeem the rough situation. God says, I work in difficulty. Don't you know that? God says, I took the cross, the symbol of hate, the symbol of fear, the symbol of death. And I made it a symbol of hope. And if you think I can take that symbol and remix it, you think I can't work in your life? God said, that's how I work. I specialize in what's seemingly impossible. Faith says, the author mentions several Old Testament people, and one of them is Abraham. And in Genesis 15, verse 6, it says, Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Faith is our faith that saves us. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9. That's what saves us. Faith, listen, faith secures our victory. See, I told you, we told you what faith is. Now we're telling you what faith does. Faith secures our victory. I love this. First John chapter 5, it says this, uh, that, that, that victory is connected to our faith. It says this, because everyone who has been born of God conquers the world. This is the victory that has conquered the world. What? Not your works, not your degree, not your pedigree, not your accomplishment. It says this is the victory that overcomes the world. What? Our faith. Our faith in who? Ain't nothing to do with you and I, but it's all about him. Faith is a lifestyle. We're told repeatedly in the Old Testament, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, it says the righteous will live by faith. Romans 1.17, the righteous will live by faith. Galatians 3.11, the righteous will live by faith. But next, faith leads to blessing. No, that's not prosperity. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. God, God honors faith. Faith honors God and God honors faith. Faith leads to blessing. Some of you, you're blocking your blessing because you're not operating in faith, because you're pouting, because you don't like the season that you're in right now. And because you don't like the season, you're giving your adult temper tantrum and you're saying you're not going to move, not realizing that you're not moving. It's not hurting God, it's hurting you. Faith is connected to your blessing. Oh, but, but right here, faith is active. Listen, faith is not having faith in faith. Uh, Faith is not passive in most cases. Faith is active. Here's what I mean. Even when God says stand still, that's an action. Here's what I learned in walking with Jesus over 20 years is that sometimes God tells me to move. Sometimes God tells me to stay still. But even when he tells me to stay still, that's still a movement. God is saying, just, just, I got this. I, I, I got this. Verse 4 through 11 goes through the hall of faith. It says, by faith, Abel offered up a better sacrifice than Cain. By faith, he was supposed to, uh, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gift. Even though he was dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now without faith, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near him must believe that he exists and he rewards those. See, faith connects to your blessing who seek him. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not seen and was motivated by godly fear, that's important, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he was condemned. By faith, I'm sorry, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place he was going to receive the inheritance. He went out even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city and that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself She was unable to have children, receive power to conceive offspring, even though she was past childbearing age. Since she's considered the one who had promised was faithful. We're giving all of these examples throughout our series. We'll dig in more, but but, but rather quickly, uh, Abel, 
uh, Abel offered uh, his sacrifice as an act of worship in Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, whereas Cain offered from works and out of routine. Enoch, he lived by faith and he did not see death. It tells us that in Genesis 5, 21 through 24, the only other person recorded like that is Elijah who was taken up in chariots of fire. Noah lived by faith and he was motivated by godly fear. And here's my question. Are you willing to be a fool for Christ? Man, man, you imagine it had never rained. They did not know what rain was. It, it did not rain for years. And here he is building an ark. When, when God calls you, you don't see it. People around you don't see it. But God, who is timeless, he sees it. And that's why you must operate in faith. Are you willing to be a fool for Christ? Can you imagine how they clowned him? Man, it ain't going to rain. Man, you stupid. And then all of a sudden, one day, drip, drip. <laughs> and one day, if you remain faithful, you'll see it. Paul said that this way in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 10, we are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. See, here's the thing. Noah's life, listen, Noah's life is in between the creation narrative of Genesis chapter, chapters 1 through 3 and uh, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12 through 15. And in between that, you have someone who shows reverential fear. And here's the point. You got to remember, it's through Noah that the, the humanity is preserved. Here's my question. If Noah doesn't operate in faith, if Noah isn't willing to be a fool by, by, by other man's measurements, when you're not willing to be a fool for Christ, if Noah wasn't willing to be called a fool, if Noah wasn't willing to be ridiculed, we might not get to the father of many nations. So the question for you is, what could you be missing out on because you won't operate in faith? What could you be missing out on because you won't take time just to write the business plan? to write the beginning stages of the ministry God has placed in you, to write the first pages of that book, to write your story, to send that message, to try to reconcile that. What could you be missing out on simply because you won't operate in faith? That's Noah. And then Abraham. A A A Abraham left without knowing all the details. Now, for him to leave Mesopotamia, he, he put himself in danger. But he had to be willing to put himself in danger in order to receive the promise. Listen to me. You can't operate by faith and play it safe. You cannot operate by faith and play it safe. You must be willing to take a godly risk. But then Sarah, I, I love this because we've been talking about all these men, but you, you, you got to have this heroes and sheroes and you got to throw sister Sarah up in there. And, and I love how the author didn't leave a woman out because the, the, the biblical narrow history, we, we get to see Sarah's faith who was past childbearing age, most likely menopausal. In fact, the Bible shows that she, she even laughed when God said it. She said, hmm, can I have pleasure in my old age? Can you believe that Sarah essentially told the God of all creation, boy, boy, she told God that but who, you know God still worked that thing out and brought her out but, but see she struggled and see she didn't believe and because she she didn't believe she said I'm not gonna have a baby so she came to Abraham and she said Abraham listen uh you, you see that little sweet thing uh, hey girl over there Listen, listen, I, I, I know you don't want to do this, but I, I want you to go ahead and, and sleep with Hagar so we can have a baby and Abraham said You sure? And she said, yes, I'm sure. And so, so, so Abraham does it. And listen to me, this is the hist history's first entanglement. Y'all get that when you get home. And, and so we see this, but then God works all of this out. But, you know, here's what I love. Not, not, not that I ignore Noah. Not that I ignore Abraham. Not that I ignore Sarah. Not that I ignore A Abel or Enoch. But I love who else is mentioned. Moses, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, prophets. And tucked in verse 31 is Rahab. Now, now, now how, how did Rahab find herself in the hall of faith? See, see I, I love this because the, 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 those people mentioned Jephthah killed his own daughter. Moses started his ministry with a murder. David set up another man's, uh, another man's wife. He, set up her, he slept with his wife, set up her husband, and God still uses him. And now you have this prostitute in here. That lets me know that there's hope. Rahab, before she met Jesus, would have been in a WAP video. 
right there with Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion. She would have been right there, but God says, I don't want them like that. I don't want them on that video. I don't want them moving or dancing like that, but they are not out of range of my grace. And so if a murderer, Moses, a murderer, David, a murderer, Jephthah, a sex addict, Samson, a prostitute, Rahab, can have access to grace by faith, so can you. And he wants us to see this. Listen, last thing we need to answer this family. What erodes faith? Or, or, or I should, should I say it this way? Who erodes faith? Who, who is eroding your faith right now? His name is Fred. Type that in the comments in all caps. Fred. Pat, Pat, can you tell me who was Fred? Fred is fear, rejection, emotional instability, and doubt. Fred, he is the one who erodes your faith. Fear, rejection, emotional instability, and doubt. Now listen, all of us must go through Fred in order to receive the promise. Noah had to go through fear. He had to go through rejection. He had to go through his own emotional instability. He had to go through doubt and start building that ark. Rahab had to go through Fred. You a freak. You were sleeping with men for money. And she had to go through all that to know that God could redeem her. Sarah, she didn't told her husband to hook up with another woman. She was past uh, childbearing age. She was menopausal, but she had to work through Fred to believe that in her old age that she could give birth to a child. And you and I, guess what? You're going to have to confront Fred too. Fear, rejection, emotional instability, and doubt. And listen, faith is not pretending like Fred's voice isn't real because it is. One of the most pivotal experiences in my life was uh, I had this experience of what was called the four chairs. And I was a part of this church residency and two counselors, two licensed counselors led this. And it was me and a ton of other church planners. And uh, I only have one here, uh, but we had four chairs. Uh, and and, and uh, the, the, there was the chair of, of your vision. I'm sorry, three chairs, the chair of your vision. There was the chair of Jesus and there was the chair of the devil. And we, we had to sit, sit in this chair and we had to say, what, what, what is the enemy saying to you? And, 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 and in true kind of church plan of fashion, all of us made the devil nice. And we would say stuff like, you know, uh, you're not going to. You're not. And, and, and then the counselor begin to, to dig because that's what counselors do. The counselor begin to prod. The counselor begin to say, no, 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 no. Stop, stop giving me these surface answers because the devil you hear is not nice. The devil you hear is not surface. The devil you hear goes for the jugular. The devil you hear, the Bible says, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy your family, your finances, your future, your children, your legacy. He's after it all. And so I had to sit there and say, I, I hear God, I hear the enemy telling me that nothing I do is real. I hear the enemy telling me that I'm a fraud. I hear the enemy telling me that this church will never work. I hear the enemy telling me that we're going to start, but we're not finished. I hear the enemy telling me that I'm going to lose more people than I gain. And I had to be real. Because Fred, he's not nice. And some of you, you hear Fred. And Fred says, you'll never be a good mom. You, you, you'll never raise successful children. You'll never find happiness because nobody wants you. You'll, you'll never, you keep dating the same man in a different body. You'll never get it right. So just get with a scrub because it's better to be in a bad relationship than no relationship because that's what Fred is telling you. Your business will never be successful. You tried three times. Every single time it failed because you're a failure because Fred reminds you of almost every single time things have failed. Your marriage will never get better. So you might as well just get out of it. Go do your thing because that's what Fred says. Fred comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if you haven't recognized yet, Fred is the enemy. Fear rejection, emotional instability, and doubt. And Fred comes for the jugular, and I've learned that I ain't got to listen to Fred. I I've learned that when Fred speaks, I let God speak for me. Y yes, I feel fear, 
but God didn't give me a spirit of fear. Yes, I've been rejected, but in Christ I receive full acceptance, even though as I'm jacked up, he still loves me. Yes, I battle with emotional instability, and I battle with most emotional immaturity, but Jesus knows everything, and he is the one who has all wisdom. Yes, I have doubt, but God develops me. He's moving, and so what you got to learn is let God speak for you through his word, and stop trying to go toe-to-toe with Fred, reminding him of your accomplishments, because if you do, you've already played into his hand. God says, I'm with you. Have you forgot you didn't do anything to deserve my love in the first place? I just freely gave it because I'm that good. I'm that good. Here's what I learned. When I battle with Fred, Fred tries to have me thinking about the outcome. Here's what I learned. It's not about the outcome. It's about the outpour. Listen to me. It's not about the outcome. It's about the outpour. God says, even when the outcome was you did fail, you did mess up, you did cheat. Fred reminds you of your many divorces. God says, even in the midst of that, I was able to give you an outpouring of my spirit to know that you can bounce back. So with boldness, confidence, assurance, and in faith, I want you to say this, not today, Fred. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Say it with me, type it in all caps, not today, Fred. And listen to me, you're gonna have to say that in your head when the battle comes, because after this sermon, it comes. When you get home, it comes. At work, it comes. But you don't have to give into that. God already gave me a vision for a series called Voices that we're gonna do next year, because we hear these voices But when I hear fear, rejection, emotional instability, and doubt, I don't have to go there because greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. Last verse, verse 12, therefore from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead came as many, as numerous as the stars of the sky and as numerable as the grains of sands along the seashore. He's talking about through Abraham's faith now. He, he literally became the father of many nations because of his faith, his faith in who? His faith in God. Now, what's the difference between Abraham and us? Abraham was looking forward to the cross. We get to look back. The difference is only one of direction. Abraham was looking forward to the cross. We get to look back at the cross, and we know that God saves. My son uh, loves to go to the swimming pool. Um, he's, he's nine now, but when, when uh, he was around three, we would go to the pool, we would put the little the things on his arm so he wouldn't go under the water, uh, but he would get on the edge and, and, and I, would, I would try to get him used to the water and I would say, um, son, uh, jump, j- j- jump, j- jump towards me. And, and because he wasn't sure, uh, Jordan would, would move up, he would kind of inch up because he, he sees his father, uh, but he doesn't have full faith that I'm going to save him. So, so, so he would inch up, and then I would have to say, I say, son, daddy, I got you. Daddy is not going to let you go under the water. Daddy is not going to let you drown. And I would say, Jordan, jump. And he would say, come closer. <laughs> he would want me to move closer to him so that he could be, feel comfortable making the leap of faith into the big pool, which seemed like an ocean to someone who's only three years old. And so I moved a, a little bit closer and I said, son, jump. But I had a limit because I knew in order for him to get over his fear, he was going to have to jump. And so eventually, Jordan jumped. And he jumped into my arms and I held him. And, he, and, and over time, now he jumps with no problem because he knows that daddy is going to catch him. If you haven't caught it, I'm encouraging you to jump. Daddy is saying, jump into my arms of grace. Jump into my arms of safety. Jump into my arms of love. I got you. I know you messed up. I know you failed. I'm not going to hold that over your head. So why you keep bringing it up? Jump. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Bible says that Abraham was a man. He was as good as dead. Jesus died and he defeated death, sin, and the grave for us. So listen to me, remove all of your identity Instagram filters. You know how you put filters to cover up your blemishes? God is saying, remove those filters. You, you keep posting like everything's okay when for real, for real, your life's a wreck. God says, remove the filter and jump. 
Remove the filter about your esteem and how you see yourself and jump. Remove the filter of how you don't love or like yourself and jump into my arms of love. And I'm saying that to you today. If you don't know Jesus, he is saying, jump. Like the song says, if grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. God is encouraging you to jump today. Listen, I want to pray for you, but listen, you don't want to miss week two as God continues to speak on to us and we build on this ingrained faith. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for believers. I want to pray for you that may be struggling with faith and spirituality right now. And I want to believe in faith that you're going to come to Christ. Father, we love and praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that the same way I told my son, we can jump. And when we jump, you catch us. You never let us down, even though we let you down constantly, God. But right now, I want to believe you to mend what is broken, to mend marriages, to mend friendships, to, to, to mend friendships between believer and non-believer, to mend some friendships between believer and believer that are strained right now. I pray that people will pick up that phone and stop waiting for them to call and that they will make the call. In faith, I believe it, but God, there's someone here who does not believe, but today they will. And I ask now that you will work on their heart by your spirit for your glory for your power, that you were saved. Listen, if you do not know Jesus, just right where you are on some of our platforms, there's a button's gonna come up where you can trust Christ. My eyes are still closed. I'm still in the spirit praying for you. We want you to click that button, but more importantly, we wanna follow up with you. But listen, let me just say this prayer. Listen, this prayer doesn't save you. Faith in Jesus does. But just say, Father, I recognize I'm a sinner need of grace and I'm thankful and grateful that you save I believe in faith that by trusting you I'm saved in Jesus name amen family I pray that you said that prayer I pray that you are a believer if you're struggling right now we have people willing and waiting to pray with you and family I am glad to be back. I love you. God bless you. See you next week.